Welcome to the Total Connectors show. My name is Kevin Davani. My very special guest is Phil Geiger. Phil, thank you so much for coming to my show. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be here, man. Yeah. So, Phil, um, uh, the reason I, I especially wanted you to have this show because I'm, I'm a really big fan of, of um, all, uh, you know, Unchain Capital, the, the company you work for. Uh, I think it's, you know, really a really useful and ethical thing uh, the company is doing. And, and especially the, the article that you wrote, um, uh, which is also, I think, is it also published on medium.com, on your medium.com uh, blog? No, so the, yeah, so the re most recent article I wrote was called All 21 Million Bitcoin Already Exist. And uh, we published that on the Unchained Capital blog. So we've, oh, we've been making a yeah, pretty big effort within the past few months to, um, to, to do a little bit better with blogging and get, getting some of our um, content out there because we have some, uh, some really sharp people on, on the Unchained Capital team. And I'm glad to hear that you enjoy what we're doing. Yeah, I, I actually joined Unchained Capital uh, remotely in May and then um, moved down to Austin, Texas in July to work in the office. But I've been in Bitcoin for quite a while. Um, and what I really liked about Unchained Capital and what interested me in, in them as a company is that they're, so they're, we're basically making the assumption that post hyper Bitcoinization, uh, people are still going to need financial services. And so we wanted to build a company that we thought, um, or the way that we thought it should look uh, post, post hyper Bitcoinization. So like um, the ethos is, you know, not your keys, not your coins. So all of the products and services that we offer um, are going to be built on a foundation of multi-sig. So the vault product, which you may have heard about already, is just long-term storage. Um, and that's client controlled. It's a two of three vault. So the client gets to hold two out of three keys. Um, and Unchained Capital holds that third key. But what I think is really interesting are all of the different like future products and services we can offer using this scheme. So the first one is um, our Bitcoin collateralized loans. So the Bitcoin's deposited into a multi-sig address. And as a client, you get to hold one out of three keys for the entire duration of your loan. So I think that's kind of interesting. We're the only company that's offering you know, financial services in that way so far. And we think that's what financial services should just look like with Bitcoin, where you're maximizing the amount of security that you get um, from holding on and authenticating with your own private keys. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. We can we can talk about it a little bit later I want, in detail. But I still, want, uh, in essence, I want to talk about your article. But still, I have one 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 question: Is the key one of the key reasons for uh, you know for the services and products uh, Unchained uh, offers? Is it because custodial um, uh, way of um, hodling or, in, or transacting Bitcoin is never going to go away. There's always going to be institutions, people with uh, especially large, you know, amounts of uh, Bitcoin that will need one way or because of maybe of convenience might need uh, custodial wallets, custodial, uh, you know, services. Is that yeah. So um, as Bitcoiners, like, or myself, like I, I never have felt comfortable with um, creating an account with any of those financial services companies, just because like you have an account with them and you don't know what's happening to your Bitcoin. They could be taking it and rehypothecating it, using it for you know um, other reasons. Uh, so what I found valuable about Unchain Capital is like, yeah, we're we recognize that today the different financial services that are available are not really leveraging like what we think is Bitcoin's innate security properties. So we are uncomfortable offering any services where we're full custodians um, of our, of our clients, Bitcoin. And today, you know, we have some of our loans are, we hold all three keys, but we really prefer not to do that. We'd much rather spread out the keys among the client, us, and then a neutral third party, just because it's, you know, it prevents, uh, a lot of the the big issues that many of the Bitcoin financial services companies have faced in the past, which is like, you know, inside jobs or hacks or something like that. Like if we don't have full control of the BTC, um, then the worst thing that can happen is uh, like a financial information leak, um, mm -hmm. which is still bad, but I think is a lot better than accidentally losing a client's Bitcoin. <laughs> it makes total sense. Yeah, yeah. makes total sense. Yeah. So it's just a different, yeah, different security model. And um, I think it, it's pretty fascinating. So, 
Great. So, uh, Phil, uh, let's go to your article, uh, which is really ex excellently written. Uh, so congratulations. I mean, it's it goes to the core of you know of, to the essence of Bitcoin. Uh, what it may what it, what makes it so unique uh, in its you know characteristics, features, uh, uh, functions, uh, uh, ethos, purpose. Um, do you want to like uh, tell me tell my tell me about my view, my viewers uh, listeners. What, what was the path? What's how did it root the you know what, what was the roots of, of the article? How did you how did you how did you get into that, that thought process? Yeah, um, well, I'm so glad to hear that you liked it. So the, the article I think I found has been pretty polarizing. Like either people read it and they're like, oh, I totally get it, and this finally like puts to word <laughs> the things that I've been thinking about, or uh, people have just been like, Phil, you're completely delusional. Like you're you know predicting the future or whatever. Um, but I was trying to write this article for really a few different reasons. Like, first of all, I'm a student of Austrian economics, so I'm not, you know, a master by any means, but I've been reading a lot of the texts. I've been studying Bitcoin for five years, and I've just found that we really, really need to think differently and to um, use, use more clear language when we're describing Bitcoin, because it's so different than anything else we've seen. Um, so... You know, that was, so I, I tried to, to take what I've learned from my Austrian economic studies and write a, um, an article that's exploring this idea, but from a, a perspective where, like, I'm going into the very basic assumptions and, and trying to build off of that. So Human Action has been a, a hugely influential book for me in my life, and so I tried to channel my inner Mises, and of course I'm nowhere <laughs> near as good as he is, but, like, I uh, just wanted to, to try to go through this this exploration um, using the the like very basic assumption that um, all 21 million Bitcoin already exist. And there's a couple reasons why I decided to do that, like um, outside of it. Um, so one of the biggest reasons for me is that I just have never understood uh, like any of those supply side predictive models because what's so unique about Bitcoin from my perspective is that it solves the problem of digital scarcity. And in order to solve that problem, you need to know like specifically how many units can possibly exist. And um, you need to know as much information and be able to verify that this is true at all points in time. Um, and then another reason that I, I chose to write that is I've, I've written a bunch in the past about um, mining and environmental issues. Um, so I think there's a lot, and, and I've just found that a lot of times people who are um, really anti-Bitcoin spend a lot of time um, on the mining aspect of it. And from my research, I've just kind of determined that mining is like, it's just not a good description of what's actually happening here. It's, you're not really mining new coins, it's just a different form of transacting, right? So people have the ability to transact Bitcoin with private key, um, like by signing a, mess, uh, a transaction with a private key. Uh, and then the other form of transacting is by selling electricity to the network, um, which we call mining. Um, so there's been a couple articles recently talking about how, you know, Bitcoin's gonna be insecure after the next X number of halvings. It's never very specific, of course. Um, and then also uh, some articles just saying like, oh, Bitcoin's an environmental disaster because mining uses electricity. And I just think that these, these are just fundamentally incorrect. And I was trying to figure out like, well, wh why did it not make sense to me? And then I think it's just because I don't view miners as creating new supply. I think that the supply already exists. And it, um, like I said before, there's just a couple ways to transact. Um, yeah, so um, let me, let me uh, I, wrote, I wrote down some of your quotes out of your article. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin, uh, uh, it goes on something like that, like the rapid monetization of a scarce, apolitical. I like that because there's so, so much discussion with a Bitcoin is political, non political. Mm -hmm. And in my understanding, it makes politics a monetary policy and politi political structures, political entities in the long run actually obsolete. That's why it's for me non-political, or does it right? I mean, apolitical means non-political, right? I mean, yeah. And when I say apolitical, like I, I mean that it, like, 
I think money or legacy currencies are just inherently super political because you have essentially government control over the supply. And so whoever's in the office is going to, at, at the given moment is going to, you know, have a different policy than another one. So it just like makes it super political. And I view Bitcoin more of like the internet, right? I don't think the internet itself is, um, is inherently political. It can be used for political reasons, but by itself, like the internet is just a tool that connects people internationally in, in the same way. Bitcoin is just a currency that is um, neutral, treats every single participant equally under the very, very fixed and um, well understood rule set. So um, yeah, so that's apolitical to me. I mean, I think you can, I think the early adopters in Bitcoin uh, have been historically like the libertarians and I, I, Mm -hmm. <laughs> tend to to agree with that sort of mindset especially now after spending so much time in bitcoin but um I, it's really for everyone like you know i've i've been trying to figure out how to um make the case for bitcoin for somebody who is like totally on the other side of the the political spectrum for me like communism or socialism and i think you can i think it's really easy like um for my perspective like the outcome of, of a socialist uh, government or a communist government is like equality, right? Everybody comes out equally, everyone's treated the same, same results. And I would say like equality is, is totally impossible to achieve when at the very, very basic level, like currencies treat people differently. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. So like, you know, I don't, I don't agree with the, the politics uh, of those, mm -hmm. those organizations anymore, but, um, but I think that, like sound money is apolitical. It, yeah. it should be just a foundation. Yeah. Now, you know why I emphasize this or I, I, I want to discuss this a little bit with you is because um, we, we tend to forget why Bitcoin in the first place. Why, why do we need Bitcoin? You know, and you, you talk about, you know, equal or at least, you know, equal chances, equal opportunities, um, you know, non-interference, um, uh, ethos and transparency you know a lot of other things of course too but but in the long run it's about prosperity of of, of humanity and i think sometimes we keep uh uh forgetting uh, sorry somebody is, is drilling uh up there in my neighbor's house so if, sorry about so let me, let me okay, yeah. <laughs> okay good uh, let me i'm gonna mute myself then um uh, another quote from me is, uh, uh, it goes something like that, like uh, blah, 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 precise knowledge about when they, you mean the 3 million that is left to be mined in the future until the year 2140 will be available for spending by private key. And then you talk about the difficulty adjustment. Uh, you want to talk about the, the, this, the, this 3 million that is left to be mined because you, you elaborated yeah. that. Well. So one of the, um, so I, I wrote this article under the assumption that this 21 million limit is totally non-negotiable. Um, and, and what's interesting and fascinating to me about the, the currently locked supply or the remaining 3 million is that we have almost precise knowledge about when, how, and, and like, yeah, when and how all of these are going to be released and spent. Like, on average, every 10 minutes, 12.5 uh, BTC until block 630,000, in which case now it's 6.25. Um, so we have more knowledge about upcoming Coinbase Bitcoin, the remaining 3 million, than we do about the unlocked supply that at any given point in time, you know, a large exchange or, you know, a large holder could just market sell them. So like all of these, um, yeah, I, I just think that that like what's so, so fascinating about Bitcoin is it gives us almost perfect knowledge about the supply, especially the upcoming supply. Um, and at any point in time, we can validate it. And so, like you know, while you're running the software at home, that if if any you know upcoming block contains a different Coinbase transaction than what we expect, then it's going to be invalidated. And we've seen that a ton of times. So um, I think just a couple months ago, for example, there was a a miner that accidentally tried to put um, higher than 12.5 uh, Coinbase transactions in, in the block that they discovered, and it was just rejected by the network. Um, in the past, you know, we've seen inflation bugs where actually from a technical perspective, the blocks were accepted and propagated, 
but that validated that social construct that we all um, agreed to. And so uh, what happened was the network from a social perspective viewed those Bitcoin as out of consensus or as a minority hard fork and node operators ran a totally different software that uh, upheld that 21 million limit. So the, the entire network is designed and built around maintaining that 21 million. Um, so that's what I think is super fascinating about it. It's the only, only network um, or really only asset that humans have ever come in contact with where the supply is completely immutable. Um, and it just pushes against all of our incentives to try and create more of it. Um, and that's through the difficulty adjustment. So the difficulty adjustment is in, there's a lot of people who's been, who've spoken about the difficulty adjustment much more eloquently than I can, but, um, it's amazing because it, it just actively rejects our best efforts to increase the supply. Um, and at the same time, it means that Bitcoin is always, and there's, there's never a case where this isn't true, but Bitcoin is always as secure as it is worth. Um, so the value of a Satoshi can change. It can go up, it can go down. Um, the number of sats that it can exist in the network can never change. Um, and the difficulty adjustment is what changes so that at any given point in time, there will be people who can sell electricity to the network profitably to secure it. Um, yeah, the amount of electricity that they sell might decrease. And we've seen in the past, like um, the hash rate kind of goes up and down, you know, after the 2017 run up, the hash rate was crash crashing. And then there was the mining death spiral FUD out there again, which kind of comes around every few years. Um, but the network just recalibrates itself. It, it adjusts itself to exactly the right amount of um, electricity that it needs to protect itself at a given point. So just by definition, the network can't be, um, can't be less secure than it is worth. Like it's always, it's always providing the exact right amount of security because of this difficulty adjustment. Yeah, I find this, you know, really fascinating to think about because uh, uh, it is unprecedented, right? It's mm -hmm. never been done in human history. I think this is also maybe the problem we have to extrapolate this into the future or, or project this into the future, what, what society, because we, first of all, we never knew how, you know, not even, our, not our generation, not our previous generation, what it is like to live under the gold standard, hard money. Maybe our grand grandparents, right? Uh, before mm -hmm. 1914 or something like that, right? So, um, so this is, uh, so there's some uh, really distinctly uh, unique features. And, and Bitcoin, on the other hand, also has like perfect attributes or features, like, like whatever, divisibility, portability, recognizability. Now, I want to ask you something, because I've, I've had this discussion a couple of times, even with my girlfriend. She said, well, what if you, yeah, I mean, divisibility is okay, but what if they start dividing one Satoshi into, you know, smaller units, then you have more. And I know you don't have more. The, the, the 21 million, that's it. But it doesn't... Uh, prevent us if it's needed to what if one satoshi you know in 10 30 years time can buy you know uh, a whole house you know <laughs> i'm just saying so yeah. what if you what if you start dividing i mean how would you explain that to a, to a newbie or or to someone who thinks about divisibility of of one satoshi what if we're going into milli satoshi Th that yeah, doesn't change I mean, anything on the scarcity side yeah you <sighs> The, the total number of units can change. And so the analogy that I like to use is, you know, you have one pizza and you can cut it up into an infinite number of slices, but you can't grow the size of the pizza. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in some, to, to some extent, this actually also holds true with any other currency, but what's different is you're not growing the value of the currency. You're just increasing the number of units. Right. Um, so Bitcoin, the number of units cannot change, but the value can change tremendously, right? Like mm -hmm. for me personally, Bitcoin is already, has already won. Um, and so I, that's how I treat it. Like it is my saving, my long-term savings currency, because I think that it's the best money. Um, so the, I, I think the value is going to go up a lot personally. Um, but what can't ever change is the number of units. And that's, that's what's really 
uh, disruptive about it. And the flip side is true as well. Like money itself is just a non-productive good. So if you increase the number of units, you're not actually making anyone better off. You're just kind of moving around the, the value or the wealth. Um, and if you are a central bank, you have an opportunity to profit off of that because you have information sooner. So the, the cancel on effect and seniorage opportunities are really powerful <laughs> incentives for central banks to uh, stay in power and create more, print more money. But what they're not doing and what they are trying to sell everyone on is um, improving the, the wealth or increasing the wealth of the society. No, they're just yeah. moving wealth around. They're moving value into their mm -hmm. pockets from other people who are holding the money. Um, so what's, what Bitcoin does is the exact opposite. It treats every single participant equally. Um, so we're all sort of in this together. Um, and it's important to note that, you know, if you're buying into Bitcoin today, there are still three, there, there's 3 million BTC worth of value that is going to be slowly uh, transitioned from being held by the network into private key uh, ownership. So that's, that's sort of my, the crux of my argument is it's just, uh, you know, after the first block was found, there were enough units of BTC to serve an economy because you can remember cut the pizza into smaller slices um, with just 99.9% .9 of the total units held by all of the participants equally. Um, so we, you know, we like to, I think people just get really hung up on uh, mm -hmm. like a number. Um, but really the, the much, much, much more important thing to focus on is the value. Um, you know, one BTC back in 2009, uh, 2009 was worth nothing. Now one Bitcoin can buy you a, you know, a sweet used car. Um, so the number hasn't changed, the value has changed. And then in the, like projecting into the future, um, you know, the, the number of BTC released every 10 minutes is going to decrease. So the value has to change. Either the value changes or the amount of electricity that is contributed to the network changes. But we don't have to worry because the difficulty adjustment always makes sure that we're using electricity efficiently to protect whatever the value of the network is at that moment. So, it's, yeah, it's a perfect yeah. harmony, isn't it? Yeah, it's crazy. Like, I, you know, <laughs> Sometimes I think like, um, like th this discovery is, is like so disruptive in such a eureka moment that Satoshi and crew or whatever just couldn't have even predicted uh, like some of the outcomes. So one of my, for example, one of my previous articles that I wrote like earlier this year in February was about uh, how ASIC chip technology is, is going to be the future of renewable energy. And I think you've, we've probably heard heard enough about um, like the environmental impact of Bitcoin, um, you know, ad nauseum, like the mainstream media is like, oh, it's terrible, it uses electricity. Um, a, lot of, a lot of good Bitcoiners have written articles about how um, it's bad for the environment, but it's really like, if you, if you go down to the very, very basics, like all Bitcoin demands is the cheapest electricity it can find. Exactly. Like, so what's the cheapest electricity? In my paper, I went on and discovered like, humans are super inefficient at energy production. Um, all of our renewable energy installations suffer from curtailment problems, which is when they produce too much supply that they have to shut off production. And uh, that ends up accounting for like hundreds or maybe a hundred terawatt hours of electricity around the globe. And that's, you know, three or four times the amount of electricity that Bitcoin uses today. So just the electricity that we waste, um, from shutting off production of our renewable energy sources is already three times or four times the amount of electricity that Bitcoin needs to survive. So there's a huge, huge opportunity for miners to get bundled up with renewable energy producers. And, and this is kind of the crux of my previous article is that mining itself isn't its own industry. It's part of electricity production. Um, and, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing them move closer and closer together um, with uh, people like, Upstream Data, who's you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, putting. I think just today, he Steve tweeted out like mm -hmm. he capped a vented methane. Uh, yeah. I mean, what thing. what could be more efficient? Like using the gas that's already going into the atmosphere or yeah. wherever. Don't, yeah. And don't waste maybe the environment. 
you know, and actually the environmentalists should, you know, stand up now and say, hey, we should, we should actually push, push this, you know, <laughs> but, you know, it's, instead, you know, they're all riding on the CO2 hawks, but okay, that's I know, my, yeah. I know, you know, I got my it's own. The, and, and it's, it just comes down to that, that basic lack of understanding where Bitcoin demands only the cheapest electricity, like, and it, it will, it will burn all of it. Like it will take as much electricity as you give it. But at some point, it's going to be worth it more to spend or to sell electricity to the grid or to people or to other uses. And then you dump the remainder on Bitcoin. But what that means is like, you know, it, first of all, it incentivizes people to go out and find areas that are wasting electricity today. But it also adds another incentive for people to go out and create and produce more efficient or cheaper energy. Um, so I think this is really good for things like renewables. It's really good for things like nuclear energy, because now, like now that we have Bitcoin and ASICs, it removes the demand side of the variable supply and demand equation. Um, and so now producers can just focus on producing as much electricity as they can and then choosing where to sell it. Do they sell it to people? Do they sell it to Bitcoin? doesn't matter. You're not wasting it. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah, is it exactly. worth it? You know, the total question, overall total question, is it worth it? Definitely it's worth it. I mean, yeah. we don't want to go you know, into the really horrific, detrimental side of sort of side effects of the Keynesian easy money uh, uh, system we live in. I mean, what is, mm -hmm. what are the consequences, the long-term consequences, you know, wars, destruction, uh, malinvestment, corruption. I mean, all these things, I mean, uh, this is a totally new, uh, I think territory or I don't know, new, uh, I would really call it evolutionary because uh, it's never been done before and it creates new structures while making the old ones obsolete. But yeah. understanding this process, I think it's, it's really hard for people because mm -hmm. they can't even imagine what kind of, you know, societal changes and economical and, and ecosystem changes we could have on a healthy soil such as Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just, I think one of the, quotes in my article is I, I just say that Satoshi crowdsources the decision of a lot of these things just to the free market. And what we've seen so far is that the free market, you know, first and foremost upholds the 21 million limit. And this is like, at this point, I think it's non-negotiable. I mean, people are going to still butt out there, but for those of us who have been in it for a while and have been running our own nodes and have, I like, I participated in the user activated soft fork, like the 21 million limits not changing. I mean, we've seen Bcash, we've seen all of these um, inflation bugs pop up. Mm. So I think the 21 million limit is like completely non-negotiable at this point. Um, and I don't even know where I was going to go with this, but <laughs> sorry, <laughs> like, I got, I got yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I forget what, what where I was going, but <laughs> no problem. Yeah. yeah. Now let's go to the next point, um, sure. uh, Phil. Um, you wrote, I hope I can write my own, uh, my, read my own uh, writing. Do miners, uh, you wrote, do miners create new supply in this scenario or just transact known coin-based transactions and transaction fees by spending electricity in the, in the uh, arm of... In the form of... In the form of, of, sorry. Yeah, in the form of drop it to two six hashes. Okay. Yeah, so this is, um, right, so if we, if we go by the assumption that all 21 million Bitcoin already exists today, then what we know is that um, miners are not actually creating new supply. They're just burning electricity, converting it into hashes, and transacting or competing to transact that Coinbase uh, fee every 10 and a half, uh, 10 minutes, as well as the transaction fee coins. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, I, I don't subscribe to the idea that miners produce new supply because it's all known. And as I mentioned earlier, we have more information about upcoming supply than what is what could possibly happen with the supply that's tracked by the blockchain. Um, at no point in time um, are, you know, can we based on what we know about the Bitcoin network, can we say that upcoming blocks will be able to successfully, um, you know, change the, the, the total supply, this total issuance. Um, it, all, it like the rules that the network follows are, there was a total of 21 million, here's exactly how they're released. 
anything that doesn't follow that path isn't Bitcoin in my opinion. So um, therefore we can say, like since we know with near perfect information when and where these, these Coinbase Bitcoin live, they all already exist. We don't need to worry about, um, oh, is there going to be like a massive influx of supply at some point in time, which is something that you have to worry about for fiat currencies or for even gold, right? Like at any point in time, if gold gets too valuable, um, it's gonna ins like massively increase the incentive for people to go out and hunt and dig up more. Um, so yeah, like I just view what we call today as mining as people who are competing by selling electricity to the network to transact Coinbase coins. Yeah, this is why I think your article is so good because it uh, pretty much uh, it, uh, disvalidates, or what do you call it, uh, invalidate, uh, disvalidates uh, the, the arguments, so-called arguments brought for us by the gold bugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Understand, you know, the differences, you know, what, what makes Bitcoin so unique and, and uh, you know, beginning with the accessibility verif uh, validation process, uh, centralization problem with gold uh, and what have you. I mean, you, you elaborated pretty much uh, better than me now. Um, so what else you wrote? You wrote everyone who knows the network, everyone who joins the network in any capacity. I think you, you touched on that already, that roughly 14% that 3 million out of 21 million that is left of the value they are purchasing as of now, uh, November, let's say 2019, is held by all participants in a network yeah. e equally only to be transacted by individuals submitting valid proof of work to order and secure transactions. Okay. Right, so, so the 21 million exists today. Who or what owns them is different. Right, so so there's uh, 18 million that are held in addresses that can be transacted via private keys, and then the remaining three million are living currently in their Coinbase uh, location um, of the block that they're they're living in. So what we can say is that so we look at the overall value of the Bitcoin network, and it's um, what is it, 100 something billion dollars in mm -hmm. measured in dollars. Well, we know that 14% of that is locked up in um, Coinbase, uh, in the Coinbase of the block that they're designated to be in. Um, so that's you know roughly 14% of the supply. So I think the, the takeaway there is when you're buying Bitcoin, remember it's not the number of, you, it's not the units of the currency, it's the value of currency that matters. So, the, so 3 million out of 21 million of the value is held equally by everyone and then only to be transacted according to the rules that we all follow, which is selling hashed electricity to the network um, and every 10 minutes and then mm -hmm. having every four years roughly. There's one point uh, it's always brought up, but I still don't know how to, how to understand it. Um, it's this conservatively, the number of Bitcoins that have already been lost either, mm -hmm. you know, because Satoshi, whatever, dead or never moved or bo uh, boating accidents or, you know, yeah. or inheritance problems or just people just, you know, lost the wallets. What do you make of that? I mean, those coins that are lost, whether they're 2 million or 4 million, it's like different conservative estimates. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a kind of another point that highlights that we know a lot more about the upcoming blocks than we do about mm -hmm. the currently existing um, BTC stored in addresses tracked by the blockchain. I mean, yeah, there's, we don't even know exactly how many Bitcoin are lost or if they're permanently lost. Um, so Satoshi we know has um, a million at least BTC. And, uh, but what we don't know is that, is if they'll ever choose to spend that. It might be gone forever. It might be spent. We have no idea, no way of knowing that. So that's just another thing that you, as a participant in this network, Need to understand is that and, and this is true of any currency like you're, you're never going to know exactly when and exactly how people are going to choose to transact um, uh, from the the Bitcoin that they hold what we do know is how and when the network will transact um, so yeah it's it's just kind of flipping that argument on its head I think a little bit like um, yeah there's there's probably what three to four million lost coins probably 
Um, that's just something that you have to keep in mind. And that's ultimately that, that actually makes it better for uh, people who have maintained control of their private keys because it means that their uh, Bitcoin are even more scarce than what we thought. So if there's, you know, a million BTC sitting in a landmine, that's a million BTC that will likely never um, uh, landfill, rather. That's a million BTC that will probably never be transacted. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So Got it. More scarce. Good. Mm. <laughs> I, I say <laughs> if you've lost your coins, you're you're donating the value to everyone equally. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is that is that something like Satoshi even said himself in one of his quotes or what is somebody else? No, anyway, it's yeah. Uh, um we have and that another quote out of your article says we have nearly 11 years of empirical evidence that the network itself has been holding and transacting bitcoin but instead of uh but instead of with private key signatures it is in exchange for hashed electricity yeah. okay you you talk about that it's it is uh it's the same of the overall network that matters and the value of the network uh, that were growing <laughs> somehow, that its monetary pro properties are sound. Yeah. So yeah, like, about, yeah. Um, this, this whole, so I mentioned in the beginning, like I believe that Bitcoin solved the problem of digital scarcity. And something that is both scarce and digital is like incredibly difficult to create. And it's only solving that problem if this limit is 21 million and fixed. If the limit can change, then it hasn't actually solved the problem of digital scarcity. Um, that's another reason why I think like any altcoin or fork of Bitcoin in the long term has absolutely no chance because from the outset, from their creation, they've unsolved this digital scarcity problem that Bitcoin solved. Like something that's digital usually by definition can't be scarce because you can just copy and paste and whatever except for bitcoin um so unsolving that to create your own altcoin is a losing proposition in the long term and you know people can increase their their bitcoin holdings in the short term by day trading and stuff like that i don't consider myself a trader i'm a uh meager hodler, last, hodler. hodler or yeah. last resort. <laughs> so i don't yeah. i don't trade i just save in btc um but yeah like the, the whole crypto a, cryptocurrency asset class just makes no sense to me because it's not scarce only bitcoin is scarce bitcoin's the only exactly. the only example of digital scarcity um because yeah i i, I yeah. articulate <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's it. Now we got to emphasize those those points. Yeah. So it's so crucial. Um, so another thing you said: uh, increasing uh, decentralization over time effectively. I love that sentence. In increasing decentralization over time effectively crowdsources the decision of Bitcoin's total supply to the entire network of participants with the basic assumption that a decentralized network of individuals will not choose to debase their own currency uh, when each participant does not have access to seniorage opportunities. Yeah, exactly. Love that. Love Thank it. you. Yeah, so, so um, I kind of touch on a couple points here, but Bitcoin solves the problem of digital scarcity by increasing in decentralization over time. So we talk a lot about like, oh, this is centralized. Oh, this is decentralized. It's, it's nearly impossible to measure or to predict the exact right amount of centralization or decentralization. So what I think Bitcoin uh, is designed to do is increase in decentralization over time. So it gets increasingly more decentralized. Um, and that's completely different than um, really anything we've seen before as well. So with gold, right, it's so heavy, you have to centralize it. With um, fiat currencies, they start out centralized. With altcoins, they kind of, um, they kind of go through this uh, like explosion of decentralization at the beginning and then slowly centralize over time. And I think the best example of that is like Ethereum. Um, so it started out, it looked like it was gonna be another competitor, it was getting more and more decentralized. But then in the last three years, I mean, we've just seen it centralize substantially 
um, to just a few different companies running full nodes and stuff like that. Um, but Bitcoin um, over the long term increases the amount of decentralization. So that's, um, yeah, that's incredibly important because, uh, and it's, it's sort of, uh, I think it's very like Austrian economics of it because there's no, no possible way for one individual to know what's the right amount of decentralization. It requires an entire market of participants making their own decisions um, to, to ultimately protect the network. And um, yeah, like, you know, because we have, uh, what is it, like 15, 14, 15,000 nodes at this point that are public, um, like, we can say that with a high level of certainty, a majority of those people are not going to vote with their software to devalue their currency. Like, that's, it, it just doesn't really make sense, especially when they have absolutely no advantage over anyone else. Like, the reason we devalue yeah. currency today, or not we, but central banks and governments to value currency is because they have a massive advantage. It's, it's profitable for them to print money because it's extracting wealth. And we talked once again about units versus uh, value, but they can extract value by creating more units. They're going to do that. Um, you know, it takes us hours of our life and effort to earn money. And the opposite is true from that for them. They actually just profit off of, not doing anything just printing money mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like exactly <laughs> um, yeah so the the basic assumption that bitcoin makes is that the market is going to choose the right um the right inflation schedule uh it's going to choose the right security through um selling through pe individuals competing to sell electricity um and the difficulty adjustment and it's been wildly successful. I mean, it's, it's mopping the floor with all other currencies, gold included, over the last 11 years. Um, you know, it increases and decreases in value in the short term. But in the long term, I mean, if you start measuring uh, other currencies in Bitcoin as the standard, they're all just like dead. Well, like the best performing yeah. currencies are a couple other alts and they're looking really bad like mm -hmm. i think the best performing currency over the last 11 years measured in bitcoin is ethereum and it's been losing value to bitcoin for the last three years almost so yeah. it's like like bitcoin's a beast it's not going anywhere yeah <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, uh, you are one of the not even few. There is a, no a growing number of people like me, like you, that have a strong conviction, a strong mm -hmm. understanding, you know, strong trust in the you know uh, evolutionary process and future, you know, and, and logical uh, process of Bitcoin. And what I was going to ask you is that I know it. Uh, it uh, people don't like the question because it always goes into prediction speculation. But what would you say is the critical number of or critical adoption rate, and the, or or even you know critical adoption rate of nodes? People having you know finally their own full sovereign nodes. Uh, what would be the number of hodlers? Uh, yeah. If there's conservative estimates, there are approximately 30. Some people talk about 50 million. Some talk about 100 million hodlers. Let's just say there are 30 million. But what would you say is the tipping point where it really, where you say, okay, the Pandora's box has been, it's been open for a long time now, 11 years, but now it's really like, you know, exponential growth. It's like the tipping point where everything is like on the trajectory curve. This is like the most exciting. Uh, yeah. Thing that I there's a couple people out there who have been saying like we're living in hyper bitcoinization right now and i agree with them like mm -hmm. um this is just what it looks like this is the these are the trials these are the tribulations like um you know the the pandora's box has been opened right governments no longer can control currency it's just not they don't have that power anymore because bitcoin came along um and so the, there's no there's no particular number. I would just say as long as that number is increasing over time, we're we're good. And for me particularly, I know if I go out, um, you know, to the bar some night, and I can convince one person to to buy Bitcoin, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. And like that's it. That's that's yeah. really all that matters. Is like, can I go out there and convince one person who's been thinking about getting Bitcoin for three years but hasn't done anything to just you know use lolly or use pay or which are some american companies that give you bitcoin as rewards like can i do that and the answer is yes and then 
we can extrapolate that and actually just see it using all the um, data out there that like, yes, the number of people who are using Bitcoin is increasing. Um, the number of nodes over the long term is increasing. Hash rates increasing. Number of contributors to this is increasing. Mm -hmm. And then we've even seen, you know, we've even seen the worst attacks against Bitcoin yeah. already already performed. Like, you know, inflation bug that didn't inflate the supply. Uh, we've seen the Bcash hard fork uh, that didn't, you know, successfully change anything about the network. Like this thing is really, really resilient. And even if there is a critical technical bug, mm -hmm. like the social consensus kicks in and protects us against that. So I think it's, I think the ship has sailed for people. Like people need to just like start getting on board and obviously don't put your life savings in it, but get some, I mean, it's, it's time guys. It's time to, yeah. Yeah. to start hodling and accumulating. Um, so yeah, yeah, and the system no... is is contributing itself. I um, always say, you know, without with everything that's going on, you know, geopolitically, macroeconomically, negative re interest rate policies. Next year, probably we're going to have in Europe, you even you know, starting in Germany. I mean, I'm in Austria, but in Germany, it's going to the recession is going to start. Banks going to crash. These are experts saying this. I mean, it's yeah. even Austrian economists, experts who know the system, they're speaking out. I mean, they're coming out and 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 they're doing Bitcoin. I mean, the most beautiful favor they can. You know, it's just, you know, the, the, the system takes care of itself, probably. It makes itself obsolete. So I don't know what's, you know, uh, what's stopping people to, you know, to, to go into action. <laughs> mm -hmm. Either the pain well, points or understanding what the future could look like. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. I, so I was talking to somebody yesterday you know, and they brought up Bitcoin because they know I'm a Bitcoiner. And so I was like, oh, are you guys, uh, you guys Bitcoiners now? And they're just like, no, not now, not ever. <laughs> and so it's, it's like people, people are just clinging on to their, their paper and it rightfully so, right? Like people have spent their entire lives chasing after this paper, yeah. this money. Yeah. And now this new currency comes along. That's weird. Um, it, it, all of the experts and all the people that they trust for their financial services don't get it. Um, but it's not and going now, away. And now they have to understand money because we never, I never, I never <laughs> knew shit no about money. money. <laughs> I never knew shit about money. You know, either people you come from libertarian, as you said at the beginning, uh, I know I met a couple of people. I know I met a guy from Norway. He actually came through a libertarian friend through to Bitcoin in year, in the year 2012. Gotta imagine. Wow. You know, yeah. and I'm like, you know, I wish I would have just understood scarcity for Christ's sake. You know, what is scarce? We never learned that in school. It's so sad. You know, it's just, but it's, on okay. purpose. it's on purpose. <laughs> right? Like we're, we're not taught, we're taught to just ignore these, these critical functions of human, of civilization um, mm -hmm. on purpose. Like, I think one of the other uh, analogies that I've been trying to help people with recently just about money in general is like we, we just don't even so we're not taught ever or I wasn't taught ever like what money is what is the most simplest definition for money um, and my definition is that money is a tool for storing and communicating value great that's it yeah but <laughs> thank you it, it, it's like the most like that sounds kind of boring but it is the most like bottom level required tool that humans need in order to cooperate yeah like if we don't have a tool that stores and communicates value effectively then we can't cooperate and you see this like in venezuela you see this all over the world where their 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 like most basic form of communication money isn't doing its job well and the the results are catastrophic mm -hmm. so it is a it like the other thing that i always bring up is that you know if it if you read research like uh, archaeology and stuff, like tablets with ledgers were like the very, very first form of communication ever discovered. So what that tells me is that money solves a problem before like almost anything else in an emerging civilization. Like before you can, you know, create written language to be able to speak, you need to be able to track and communicate value. <laughs> Like, I don't know. So anyways, like it's a foundational tool. And if it is distorted, then everything built upon it is going to be distorted.
So we yeah. need a we need a rock solid tool that with very very clear rules, fixed supply, that we can use as a as a as the best measuring uh, stick of of value and the best communication tool. So to me, it just like I don't know. I've I've been in it like I said for quite a while now. So it's um, I'm becoming increasingly more convicted over time. Um, but it just seems to make so much more sense than than the, the traditional system, which is effectively a, a system of barter. We we recreated yeah. barter in the 20th century. Like, I don't want to hold yuan. So if I want to buy something from China, I have to go through like six different middlemen, increases the price of everything, the cost of everything, decreases the um, the quality, I think, and the transaction times. It's, it's just silly. It just doesn't make any sense to me when we have the internet, which is like a global, it's like we're, we're all connected now. Everybody in the world, like, okay, Bon, you and I are sitting across the world having a video conference talking about Bitcoin. You know, like, yeah, we're who could have imagined that? Who could have imagined yeah. that? I mean, you know, like, whatever, 10, 20 years it's ago crazy. or something. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so. at least 20 years ago. I don't know. But, yeah. uh, but uh, Phil, I mean, let me see. Let me see for a final. Uh, what, what do you see? Do you see a society where Right now, people cannot even imagine what kind of society or technological, societal, scientific innovation. It's one of my favorite questions because it always goes back also to the Bitcoin standard. Safed and Amus talks about it, the gold standard, the easy money, the technological innovations, zero to one, you know, um, uh, innovations. Who was that? Um, the author? Um, of, uh, Peter Thiel. Peter, yeah. So, yeah, let me ask you just your thoughts. What, what, where, do you see, where do you see humanity? I mean, in 10, 20, 30 years? I mean, we, we live in crazy times right now. Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I honestly don't know. Like, I think, I don't think that it's going to be a smooth transition. That's like my biggest fear. Um, as, an, uh, as an American too, I think, um, I think the U.S. is at a massive disadvantage compared to other places in the world because we've had the global reserve currency for like three or four generations now. We don't know anything beyond the US dollar is king. Um, and pretty much nobody else in the world should even want to be using the US dollar. And it makes no sense to me at least. Um, and that's kind of what we're seeing. So we're seeing places around the world where uh, there's a large, uh, there's, there's a good internet penet penetration as well as uh, like mobile usage. Like I, I always look at, um, what is it? Matt Alberg's site, uh, Useful Tulips. Um, cause his data science is beautiful, but it shows that places like Colombia, like Turkey, um, all these places that have bad currencies, um, good, good technology penetration are just like swarming to Bitcoin. Like all of their trading volumes are increasing like pretty much week after week. And then certainly in the long term. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I, I totally see the, the U S in particular losing this, this race because we like Americans just need Bitcoin the least today for us. It's like a speculative fun investment. Like, Oh, it went up a hundred percent, you know, sell at the top for us dollars. A lot of people are still measuring wealth in us dollars. Um, and I think increasingly around the world, like people are starting to use Bitcoin as that um, really solid unit of measurement. Um, so yeah, that's my biggest concern. I think I don't think it's going to be a smooth transition. I think it's going to be rocky, um, you know, as people. And I, I think also the weaker currencies are going to start hyperinflating faster and faster. And like the U.S. dollar will probably be the last fiat currency to start hyperinflating, um, but it will. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's make a wish. Yeah. So Phil, yeah. thank you so much. I, enjoy, I really enjoyed our talk. Um, can you like uh, uh, tell tell my viewers where they can find you, and I'll I'll put them in the show notes anyway. But and I hope yeah. we'll see each other. You know, either in the you know uh, either maybe during a panel talk, panel discussion, or uh, during an event in Vienna, or you know, in maybe in. The, Germany. Yeah, I got to get back to Vienna. I love yeah, Vienna. Yeah. <laughs> <Definitely>. <laughs> I always tell people, Vienna is the city that you build in if you're in the 1800s and you have infinite money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's got a cool life, a quality of life, definitely. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm um, I'm at Phil underscore Geiger on Twitter. Uh, you can email me Phil at Unchained Capital dot com. I'm happy to help you guys out with, uh, you know, learning about our Bitcoin financial services, or if you're looking to improve your custody with multi-sig, reach out to me. 
Um, and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be around. So I think Twitter's probably the best and easiest way to reach me. You can always DM me. Um, and uh, I like to mix like uh, my, my Twitter profile is like a mix of, of weird, inane humor and Bitcoin economics. So <laughs> yeah, and a passionate biker I've seen. Already. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I love great video. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I love mountain biking. So I'm going to probably do a few more mountain biking slash Bitcoin videos and get them out there. <laughs> Okay. Well, keep up your beautiful work, uh, oh, Phil, you. and I hope we'll see each other soon. And yeah, all the best. All right. Yeah, likewise. Talk to you soon. Thanks so much, Kevin. Bye, Phil. Bye -bye. Thank you. Welcome to the Total Connector. My name is Kevin Davani. Total Bitcoin, total freedom. The hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history. Bitcoin.